Welcome to another episode to the Emerging Markets Entrepreneur. Here's uh, Alex Kniebs again, founder of Printulu, and welcome uh, with me, my co-host, Sid Wahi. Today, we have a very special, interesting guest, Melvin Lubega, who uh, is a former strategy consultant at the Boston Consulting Group and who is now a director at Go One. Melvin, welcome to the show. No, thank you, Alex. Glad to be here. Great. Melvin, uh, let's jump directly into it. Uh, give us a little bit of a download how you have become so successful uh, at such a young age. Uh, director at Go One, uh, a company that uh, Microsoft has invested in. Um, how did this happen? Yeah, I mean, and thank you for the young age piece. I've been moisturizing, so I'm glad you can see that coming. <laughs> um, but no, I think I've been very fortunate. Um, I'd even say in Go One and some of our other business ventures to have like really good partners and team members in our business. And so, I mean, just for some context, as you alluded to, um, Go One is our, is our main business. And essentially what we do at Go One, just for context for everybody, is that we are essentially now the world's largest online corporate training library or hub. So just think of us like a Netflix or corporate training where we bring together training across different providers from around the world into one subscription, into one content hub. Um, and so we, we began the business in 2015. Um, that was shortly after um, um, Andrew, one of the business partners, one of the co-founders, um, and, and myself finished up our um, master's at Oxford, where we actually focused on education, learning, and technology. But I think, if you to your question directly, I think it's still very early, um, both in our journeys um, and also in terms of where we are with the business, but very grateful for the success we've had so far. And more importantly, great to have great backers like Microsoft alongside with us. All right, great. So um, we've talked a, a little bit with, with different VCs, with different business leaders, and sort of um, a lot of them made the distinction that there are sort of three categories for um, um, that's sort of showing in this crisis. The one is the clear uh, companies that are benefiting from it, then the companies that just have to completely restructure the cost base and they are fine, and then the companies, especially in tourism, that are just yeah, out of business, basically, at least temporarily. Um, yeah. Go One seems to be one of the companies of the first category, isn't it? How have you reacted and how have you sort of uh, leveraged on, 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 on the development that COVID-19 have brought? It's interesting, you know, I'd probably say some of the best companies go through all three at different points of the cycle. I think it's a time when your clients are uncertain, they don't know if they want to renew, then you get lots of new clients coming through, want to also be part of the journey. And also, we even, even for us as Go One, begin to question certain parts of our value proposition. Um, and so I think if we are transparent, I mean, so during the crisis, we're fortunate um, quite early on to have concluded um, a $40 million raise um, led by Madrona, Microsoft, Salesforce, and others. And it definitely did give us the firepower, but that's something which we would have wanted regardless of the crisis because we are very much growth-driven in terms of our organization. But if I think about exactly what we have done, I think, yes, we're very fortunate that we've had some of our biggest quarters um, since the start of our business um, during this time. But in the same vein, it's a mixed bag. And I think it's bittersweet because we have, because ultimately our clients are bricks and mortar businesses. And so we've had, for mm -hmm. example, two large retail clients in Australia um, who actually went bankrupt during this time. Um, and, and many clients have also downsized their staff. And so if our model is driven by the number of employees you have, I mean, it does affect that. But in the same vein, what we are seeing is that lots of companies that hadn't necessarily embraced digital transformation, digital learning, um, definitely are realizing it's definitely a better way for them to upskill and invest in their staff. And so at that level, our key focus during this time has been how do we stay close to our clients regardless of the ability to grow the account, the money they have, just how do we shop for them during this time? Um, but also in terms of our product offering, how do we remain most relevant to people that don't necessarily know who we are? And so, for example, during this time, we partnered with Microsoft and launched a Teams application where you can do learning directly within Teams because Teams is, and similar tools have gained lots of traction during this time. And so how do we ensure that learning from a Go One perspective is intuitive in that interface? And so it's definitely been a focus on one, come back to the core, understand what we're good at, um, which is, you know, you know, curating, delivering, um, enabling training, but also thinking through how we deliver that during this time. Mm. So how much have you grown in, in the past couple of three to six months? Um, sure. I'm trying to think what numbers are there versus not. Um, but yeah, let's say probably 3x and some of our key metrics in the business. 
sure. So I, I you know, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions about the, the the value proposition and some of the challenges that you see. So, um, what are some of the challenges with delivering programs and and training? Um, over the internet and uh, digitally as opposed to doing it face to face. Because you, one of the things that we've seen is that during this pandemic, it's not just the corporate market, but pretty much everybody has been forced to embrace um, uh, telecommuting and, and uh, getting you know, instruction delivered uh, digitally. Uh, is, do you see that as a, as a mind change that's still happening or you know, have people become accustomed to it? And, and what are your comments on that? So it's an interesting one where I think for a long time, as many of you know, most companies spent a lot more of their training on in-person and face-to-face -face training. Um, and also because there was some benefit when you did training, you could go take a holiday somewhere, get a day of work and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, definitely as we're seeing the move to online, the question is less around taking, let's say, a document and then putting it in a PDF form and putting it online. It's almost like rethinking the whole learning journey because right. you think about how we learn. The reality is if I ask someone, how many courses do you do a year? Or when is the last time you actually took a formal course? And the key thing there is trying to understand how people learn. And it's often through the article someone shares, the video someone watches. And it's almost like micro learning with different pieces coming together. And so even the pedagogical approach and the instructional design behind the training itself needs to change for a digital format to capture the benefit of digital beyond it just being a copy paste of in-person. And so at that level, we are seeing organizations embracing it. But particularly what we see um, in Africa more specifically is that many organizations are quite early on that journey. And so therefore, it's almost as a trusted partner sharing our international express to get them on that journey even better. Sure. And um, just again, for the sake of our viewers, you mentioned, so you mentioned Australia. Where is your largest market for Go One? Um, you see a global player, but where, where do you see the most amount of uh, growth opportunities? Yeah, so, so different questions. I mean, so our largest operation versus, I'd say, our, our biggest sure. growth opportunities. I mean, so for clarity, I mean, so um, service clients in over 20 countries have offices in eight and so do have good time zone coverage, which is something I'm very grateful for, given in the early days we used to cover all time zones in one place. Um, but <laughs> definitely, um, I'd say in terms of scale and maturity-wise, I'd say Australia would be our most, most, most mature market um, just because um, most of my co-founders from Australia, some of our early investors were Australian, and so therefore we're able to leverage that network there. Um, but in terms of growth, I think definitely what we're seeing is in our emerging market business um, being some of the fastest growing, but in the same vein, I think the most exciting size of the prize ones is the US, for an example, just because the US market is a very mature market, and therefore what you typically find is, let's say, if, for example, we have some clients um, uh, we service the same Mauritius and Kenya. And the reality there is often in those markets, we are a bit of a market maker in that we are bringing our product for the first time, helping organizations think about digital learning for the first time in their journeys. And so therefore you almost pay a higher cost of acquiring and educating the market. Whereas for example, in let's say the US or even Australia, because they're more mature markets, you almost are um, replacing or capturing market share. Um, and so you almost find there's a bigger spend already in play there and also typically a lower cost of acquisition for a customer. And so definitely when you think of those markets, I'd say one, um, South Africa seeing some phenomenal growth here as well, just because it is a blend of emerging and also developed to some extent in terms of the corporate culture. Um, and also the US, um, definitely because what we often find there is someone will be like, oh, you're like X, but better. Um, or you're like Y, but you give more value. And so it's easy to convert at a peer face-to-face -face level. Yeah, Alex, uh, already kind of asked you a little bit about, um, you know, the last couple of months and growth and, and things like that. But um, forgetting the corporate for a second, how has it been for you? What has been different for you over the last couple of months? And I'll, I'll give you a bit more um, uh, background to that question. Whenever we, we bring this question up with our guests on the show, they, they tend to talk a little bit about how digital transformation has been accelerated 10 years in the last three months. And I've heard more than one person say that. So let's, you know, um, let's try and address that, but, you know, let's see if we can talk about something else outside of digital transformation this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, and fair enough. So being in tech, I think digital transformation is definitely our starting point. But I mean, just as a segue to the point you mentioned, you know, many of our clients felt they weren't, they weren't, there was too much risk to transforming. Whereas right now it's almost like a business need. And so there was a meme I saw the other day where it asked, what has been the biggest driver of the transformation in your business? And it was like CEO, CIO, and COVID-19. <laughs> so definitely in these times, we're seeing a lot of that take place. But I mean, for myself, and I think to your question more exactly or specifically, so because I've always had teams of people reporting into me 
outside of where I was. It was often, I was a bit of a remote nomad. Yes, I have offices here in various countries, but often I was taking midnight calls, early morning calls at home and so forth. And for me, what I've come to realize during this time is just the importance of self-care and mental health. I think particularly when you think through in South Africa, we went through a 21 day lockdown. No one could leave their homes. Everyone was, was confined. I mean, I love my house. I love my garden. I love my dogs. But in the same way, just that what that does for your mental health, I realized the importance of, you know, checking in if you're okay. And those friends to check in if you're okay. And things that you take for granted because you're so busy in the hustle and bustle of life. And so for me, that was very important. But in the same vein, also realizing the importance of being a entrepreneur or leader in a business. I think during this time, there's lots of uncertainty, or there was lots of uncertainty for many other people in, in, our, in our spaces, but also just forgetting remember, or realizing that my staff and my team are also going through the exact same uncertainty, if not worse off, and just that importance of not forgetting that we're all humans at the end of the day, and so hopefully by taking better care of myself, I'm better able to be a better manager for my people, just because I did find that during the period of time, it's very easy to use that perspective. And, and, and almost forget that, like, look, there's a community, there's a culture, there are people that love you. And I think for me, it was very important to remain active and keep and, and, and do exercise and read and follow the books that I follow and so forth. So, yeah, that's, a, that's a, some very good points. I was going to ask you if you had any advice for entrepreneurs, but a lot of that advice is, is, is just good advice for anybody. Um, let me ask you something different then. What, what are you reading at the moment? So... Funny enough, the, the book I'm reading now, um, so I am a sucker, so I'm reading a few books, um, but I'm a sucker for biographies. And so mm -hmm. I'm reading um, The Economic Development of Southern Africa, um, which essentially is an economic history of um, Ernest Tapanama, but particularly um, Anglo-America, just because mining as an industry is so intertwined in the, in the last century of Africa's growth. And so just reading his story and just how he transitioned, because he, people often think of the titans of today, I think it was obvious where they got to where they became. But I mean, just as a small anecdote, by the time Ernest Oppenheimer came to Africa for the first time, when he was, I think, must have been 30 years old, the reality is all the roads, like um, Cecil John Rhodes, Barney Bonato, all the big mining loads had already established the diamond industry. They were already titans in the space. And so the young person, just reading his journey about how he grappled with certain things on his journey, I always appreciate. Another book I'm reading now is one called Big Friendship. Um, and it's interesting because it's just about um, two individuals who are very famous for, 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 for their blogging and their, and their podcasts. But just how do you be a better friend to people? I think people don't spend enough time not only investing in relationships, but also how do you invest so you can invest better in relationships? And so those are the two books that I'm currently listening to. Um, one I just finished, though, which I really, really enjoyed um, was um, particularly What It Takes. So What It Takes... Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve Schwartzman, so the founder of, 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 of BlackRock and Blackstone, Blackstone and just his journey and just appreciating, you know, often people know where one, someone ends up, but never the journey they took to get there. And so what I quite like about his particular book is just how he takes us on that entrepreneurial journey and how it wasn't, it wasn't all made out um, on that journey as well. Okay, coming, switching gears a little bit back to uh, entrepreneurs, you know, we, we've, again, synthesized a lot of data from a lot of guests. Everybody talks about um, what the most important thing to look for. And the one thing that, you know, again, comes up is something like product market fit and, and uh, having a large enough uh, addressable market, both of which you seem to have figured out with Go One. Um, what are some of the other challenges that it takes to, you know, scale a business and to, to, to be involved with the startup, particularly as an entrepreneur? Yeah. You know, the, the amount of school fees we've paid in, in the journey, I think you know, sure. it's really easy to look back and romanticize the journey. And so, you know, often I find, so I'm a strong believer that it's great people that make a business. But in the same vein, what I've come to appreciate even in our journey is that often people and even yourself and your mindset can be inhibitors. So, for example, I think when we entered, when we, entered, when we started the business in 2014, 2015, we won the award for the best new learning platform in the world um, amongst some industry experts. Oh. And so we're focusing there on a very like learning management, learning delivery system focused on just the actual, almost what I'd say the shelf, my shelf in the background, I built it during lockdown from pivoting to, to carpentry, anyone shot. Yeah, shit, this, that's um, not bad, man. That's really not bad. Uh, <laughs> if, if all else fails, you can always go back to a trade skill. <laughs> exactly. But no, so the point is that what we're offering back then was simply a bookshelf without any books. And so what they realized was that if we focus on servicing our clients and meeting their needs, which was no client, or most clients don't say, 
I want to spend X million on a training platform. They want to say, I want to spend on investing in my staff. I want to spend on training. And so by us realizing that our value wasn't the platform, it was more so finding a solution to training, we were then able to better pivot our business and focus on the training content, which is what we focus on now, which makes up 95% of our revenue. And so now we almost sell the books that go with the bookshelf together. And so I mentioned the point only because it's easy to say you want to build the Uber for X or I must build this app. But the starting point should be, what problem are you solving? Mm -hmm. And I found in our journey by always asking that question, are we solving the problem the best way possible? Has always been a good way for us to make sure that we, one, create more value, but ultimately capture it. And I think having that clear vision and then having the right people in the organization have been our two success factors. Sure. Um, Alex, before I throw back to you, I just have one more question. This is something that's very close to my heart, uh, education in general. Um, so I've been following a lot of ed tech investments and innovation in ed tech, and I have to say that I'm largely disappointed. There's a lot of money chasing it. There's a lot of, but the fundamental innovations in the sector, at least I haven't, I haven't seen. And you mentioned something like micro learning and and uh, curriculum development and creating digital uh, curriculum. Well, aside from you know, aside from what we've seen with Coursera and all these other firms, do you see anything that's truly groundbreaking and something that's truly zero to one, not an iterative, uh, you know, uh, build on something that already exists? Yeah. You know, it's interesting, you know, the most groundbreaking innovations are the ones that will fade into the darkness. Like we take light for granted now, electricity and so forth. And so yeah. in the education space, if we keep the learning outcomes as a success and what success is, the right is, um, and even though I'm at the core phase of a lot of the innovations, I'm not seeing any like transformative ways of learning. Yes, you can come with AR, VR, you can do immersive yeah. learning. There are lots of things like that. But whether they are like dem demonstrably leading to higher learning outcomes, the funny thing with education is the fundamentals and getting those right are often the most successful factors to get engaging things. So for example, there was a, there was a study done where, where people realized that although companies spend lots of money on, let's say, um, online learning and so forth, there's very little uptake, even in some of the biggest players globally. And the logic mm -hmm. is because the tools and the interface through which people were consuming that training was difficult. Because you can have the most amazing video, but if it's behind 10 or 20 clicks and you have to log in 10 times, you will never get to see that video. Absolutely. And so often it's basics like, make sure user experience is very simple. And that's why for us, I mean, when we won the award in 2015, it was, for, it was because of the ease of use of the platform, because our mantra back then was, you shouldn't have to learn how to learn. It needs to be intuitive. And so often you won't see, you know, the not to one changes, but often it's just doing the basics right that will get you far on the journey. That's uh, good, good advice. Alex, over to you or back to you. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Sid. Amazing, amazing insights on, on how, uh, Melvin, how you have adapted to, uh, to the COVID personally and what you've uh, trained yourself on. But now let's go a little bit back on... Um, uh, advice for other entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, uh, we've been sort of, uh, we all have a sailing boat as entrepreneurs and right now the, the sea is very rough for some more than for others. But what does it actually mean now for, for other entrepreneurs, for SMEs, for business owners, um, you know, for all those fighters out there? Um, yeah. What do you think, Melwin, is uh, crucial right now, given the changing environment and how to structure your business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think what's crucial now during these times is to go back to what are your core competencies and what is what is your core, what is the thing that you're better than anybody else? I think during like, you know, heydays, good economic times, it's very easy to, um, you know, focus on other things, try to push the frontier, but almost say, what is the core value add you have? And so I've, even in our businesses, just looking back to our core has helped us weather this, way, this storm in a very particular way. Um, and I think that's what's important. I think also stay very close to your customers and your target audience. I think mm -hmm. if you ask the question, you know, what can companies do to remain, to, 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 to be relevant after COVID or after this pandemic, I would argue it's about remaining relevant through the pandemic because there's no, you know, point at which guys will say, okay, now COVID's over, we're back to normal. But those that even if they, you know, in cricket, we say just staying on the crease gives more probability of actually scoring runs. And I think there's something to be said around just continually showing up and remaining relevant, even in the smallest way possible. I mean, some of our, from the investing side, I mean, some of our companies um, have done some amazing things during this time to pivot. So, I mean, one of them is a transportation company 
um, down in Cape Town, Rosap and Joburg, where they were purely focusing on corporate commuting. So, for example, if you as a company, Printuli wants to offer its staff a shuttle service to provide that as a service to companies. But during this time, what they actually ended up focusing on was becoming the transportation um, of choice for essential workers. Because they had certain levels of security and safety they followed, they also were able to get certain permits in place. And just being able to pivot and change your focus, if their core thing was logistics, technology enabled, but how do you make mobility possible during that time? And so I think it comes down to focus on the core competency and pivot from there. Mm. And do you think uh, the structure of a business needs to change in order to keep showing up, focus on your core competencies and stay close to your clients? Do you think there is a perfect structure for... No, so... For yeah, and it's a very valid, yeah, it's a very valid point. I think business structures need to be continually changing. And I even think about an hour side at Go One. I would argue in the last, in the last two years, we probably changed our structure three times. And it's mm. not because we got it wrong. It's because we're growing at a fast rate. We want to make sure we're better servicing our clients. And so the question is always, if you think about, they call it pivoting. When you pivot, you're pivoting around something. And in the same way, when you're thinking about structure, thinking about people, thinking about where your resources are, It's about saying, what is your true star, your north? And if your focus is this particular business metric of clients of this particular type, the structure is fluid. And I think it's tough, particularly as business people, especially as entrepreneurs, where because your people have been there from you early in your, in your business, in your journey, or you've got, let's even in our business, co-founders whose roles have changed over the time. And I think it's about keeping the main thing the main thing. And so structures arguably are malleable to achieve the objective because if a structure is not serving a purpose, it needs to change. Um, and I think it's also, but in the same vein, I'll say that, but don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. And so I always believe in being able to, one, you know, maybe my inner consulting is exposing me here, but have an hypothesis <laughs> around, we believe that this particular way is something that will help us grow our business and mm -hmm. make the necessary investments and almost have checks along the way uh, so that you know that you're making the right investment or the structure is working in a particular way. So you, you, you are, uh, I mean, this is a long discussion in, in, in the history of management studies. You say basically uh, structure needs to follow strategy, not strategy needs to follow structure. No, exactly that. Um, because I think there needs to be a congruency in it, definitely. But I think something has to lead. And I think that's it. Okay. And um, now that we get the structure, so if we get the structure right, how do you make a structure fluid or as fluid as possible? Like if you're now adapting, do you have some advice for entrepreneurs that want to change structure, that need to change structure because of external pressure? Are there some best practices to follow? Yeah, I think the best organizations move in unison. And the way in which organizations move in unison is there being transparency, fluidity, but importantly, good communication across the organization. And so, for example, during these times, let's say businesses have had to pivot and change certain things, close operations, open new operations. If the business as a whole is aware of the current state of the business, decisions being made, it's very easy to be like, look, because you guys know in this position, therefore we should change. And it's easy to get people on board. Because as I mentioned earlier, people can make and break your business. And so I think by enabling a structure, it's not only the people, but you often say, look, you want... You want people in the right seats doing the right things. And so the right things are deformed by processes and structures. And I think often as an organization, you need to review your structures and processes and say like, look, why can't this be done differently? Why must there be five steps in this journey? But in the same vein, also being able to bring people along on that journey. And for me, that often comes down to making sure that you operate as one organization, which is, of course, underpinned by your culture. But I would say during this time, the best thing um, I would say we've done in our businesses is just being transparent and saying like, look, this is what we currently are. These are the numbers. You know, back gone are the days when, you know, only the C-suite saw the numbers of the business and the half of the business where you were at. For us, the gecko boards and we can say, like, look, these are our sales. This is the revenue for the month. Just so everyone knows their realities as opposed to it being like, oh no, the senior guys are deciding and pushing things down. Mm. Oh, very good. Because you're trying to build trust um, and trust enables collaboration. Exactly. Mm. All right. And um, when we go more towards the strategy now, um, so uh, the, the environment is, is, is changing. How, how have you changed your strategy? You've, you've said you're trying to stay to your core competencies um, and you're trying to stay close to your clients. These are sort of the two guiding factors for you. 
Um, yeah. Do you have any other advice or any, any sort of steps to follow when you're changing strategies? As a former management consultant, you should have a few in, 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 in the petal, eh? No. no, it's true. And I think, look, there are many approaches to strategy. I think mm -hmm. for me, strategy is simple. How do you, one, create value? And two, how do you capture it? Um, and mm -hmm. so you want to be in spaces or play in spaces where you can create the most value. Otherwise, you can't capture that value. And so even though you can stick to your core competencies, I'm not necessarily saying that you're, but when you fully understand your core competency, that you won't necessarily change your core business. And I think that's important to say, because by, it's almost like, not, I'm not saying change your Lego blocks, but use your Lego blocks in the most effective way possible. And so when I think about strategy, it's in the exact same way. And so when we think about even during this time when we've made investments, even within our current businesses or outside of that, when you thought about the strategy, it's about saying, are there businesses out there whose competencies are, um, who are complementary to our own, as an example? Um, and so I think depending on your natural endowments or your starting points, your strategy will be different. If I had to begin a tech business today versus given where we are with Go One and, and its national teams, it's a very different approach. And so strategy to some extent is unique to your starting points and your ambitions. Mm. So you said that you've, um, you've raised uh, $40 million just before COVID uh, or the lockdown basically happened. Um, and a lot of businesses right now, they sort of say, or a, a lot of media, business media is now publishing a lot about resourcefulness and that VC is changing. How, how do you now with 40 million in your, in, your, in your pocket, how do you approach resourcefulness as part of your strategy? Well, I mean, so one, it's not my pocket, it's the company pocket. Um, <laughs> Very important <laughs> distinction. Um, I... <laughs> Um, so those things where like you see the money coming and you see, you see the wire transfer coming and you get excited, but you're like, ah, damn it. Um, but in the same <laughs> way, I think it's, 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 so during this time, so, um, a it's a great note that you should give to Cyril Ramaphosa as well and the government. I, I see you've posted a picture with him, uh, just today or yesterday. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, like, I think it's, it's, it's very easy to be tempted by those things, but I mean, to the point I was mentioning where around, you know, emerging markets, and venture specifically. So during this time, we had a conversation with um, Reid Hoffman. So Reid Hoffman um, is the founder of LinkedIn, co-founder of LinkedIn, partner at Greylock, board of Microsoft and so forth. And phenomenally well as an entrepreneur. And he was saying that like, you know, emerging market businesses have been better placed to weather the storm or that storm being the pandemic, just because we find that emerging market entrepreneurs are more cost conscious and have mm -hmm. less fat in their businesses. I think in Silicon Valley, and I mean, I, I saw when initially booked go on, I lived in San Francisco for some time. I mean, there was almost a sense of like, you're willing to burn money, spend money at all costs to grow your revenues and that kind of stuff. Whereas you find in emerging markets, because there's almost, there's a less deeper venture capital pool or general investment pool, people are generally more conscious in how they build their business in terms of costs and resources. And so yeah. definitely, I think there's something to be said around paying attention to your costs because, um, you know, so I invest, I invest in a few businesses, both bricks and mortar, some PE and so forth. And something I always reflect on some of my co-investors is how times have changed. I think particularly in venture capital and tech investments, where back in the day, you had to get customers to find your business. You actually had to have a successful business to actually continue to grow. Whereas now there's the option of doing lots of grants and things where you don't necessarily need to focus on growing customers, you focus on getting grants for your business and trying to grow it that way. On the other side, you have lots of capital following businesses whose fundamentals aren't quite right. And so it's almost like as an entrepreneur, you can focus on everything but growing your customer base and mm -hmm. still succeed in terms of getting capital if that's your metric. And so really at that level, it doesn't promote resourcefulness. But what we definitely find is in our business is about being able to give managers PNLs, just create that accountability because it's very easy to your point to say like, look, oh no, you've got $40 million in, in, in the business. Now you can go forth and increase everyone's salary um, or start being frivolous. And the funny thing is we've done the opposite where in the business we've brought on um, a very senior um, business executive who has experience scaling and building business. The last business he built is now listed on the London Stock Exchange, a couple billion pounds. And just bringing that sort of diligence into the business around cost control. Um, just because you don't actually need to wait until you're on your last penny to actually get better in building and structuring your business when you can actually build a more defensible business that generates significant cash and significant profits. Mm. Very interesting. Um, 
Sid, do you have any other questions when it comes to investing or any, any other advice when it comes to invest, investing into, into businesses in these times? Yeah, so I think you, you know, you've just gone through a big round and um, you know, you've talked a lot about what um, um, you know, sort of you've seen in, in, in other companies where you have investments you, and you've seen them grow. Uh, but what, what do you think investors are looking for right now? If you had to just sum it up into a nicely packaged piece of uh, advice for people looking to start their own businesses, what are, what are investors looking for? Yeah. So it's interesting now where the best investors are the ones that haven't changed their investment philosophies during this time. If anything, mm -hmm. now's been a good time to, 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 to almost stick to your guns. Um, yeah. And so for a long time, so I began investing now probably 12 years ago and back then we were very much inspired by warren buffett alan gray like value investing but right now when i think about my investments it's one the people so who's the entrepreneur and the jockey that i'm backing and are they bullish and excited by the opportunity in front of them because you can't have a key person in the business who's not excited by the future and wanting to build but in the same vein you want to look at key fundamentals for example i invest in both venture as well as very big bricks and mortar businesses and so I look at very different things, whereas in venture, it's all about, you know, who are the people, what unfair advantage they have, the problem they're solving. And importantly, do they understand the problem they're solving better than anybody else? Because that will allow them to create a better solution than anybody else. Whereas on the venture side, I'm looking for businesses that have a moat that's defensible by a different type of moat, whether that's in, you know, the relationships they have, the product they built, the IP they've generated, um, to be looking for businesses that have good margins in the EBITDA and sustainable cash flows such that you can use that cash to reinvest elsewhere. And so when I think about investment, depending on the hat you wear, it's different things. But ultimately, as I was mentioning, um, uh, the book I was reading earlier, um, Stephen Schwarzman, at BlackRock, they had one simple philosophy, don't lose money. Um, and so I think <laughs> if you begin with that, if you begin with that and you end with that, um, you, you'll do very well in your investments. But ultimately, for me, when I think about business building and investments, there are two things I consider. Um, one is that I want to build businesses whose ideas are so exciting they keep me up at night, but I want to partner with and invest in businesses I wish I started. And so for me, that's my litmus test. I think very well put. We're going to use that it's in the... really great, yeah. We're going to use that in the description of the video when we, when we publish it. Yeah. <laughs> but right. I... Yeah, I think um, uh, we, we've uh, hit the uh, allocated time. So, Melvin, thank you so much for taking time out and some of these insights are just brilliant. Uh, this is what I love about this show is every time we speak to, some, every time we speak to a new guest, we take something else out of it. And uh, it's been incredibly valuable. So thank you so much. No, thank you to you and Alex. It's been a very insightful conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Melvin, for this great uh, insight. And... Um... Uh, I hope some of our uh, listeners and viewers will hit you up for investment. <laughs> no, look, we're always happy to deploy capital effectively. <laughs> effectively being All the right, keyword. Right. <laughs> Thank you. No, thanks, guys. Ciao.